Welcome to the Private School Leader Podcast, where private school leaders learn how to thrive and not just survive as they serve and lead their schools. I strongly believe that it is possible to have a long and happy and fulfilling career as a private school leader. And my passion is to help you figure out exactly how to do just that right here on the Private School Leader Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Minkus. I want to start today's episode by asking you a question. Do you want to have a long career as a private school leader? I'll ask that one more time. Do you want to have a long career as a private school leader? And I think probably most of you said yes. Um, I didn't say long and happy career. I say that at the top of every episode. But um, of course, I want you to have a long and happy career. But I wanted to talk today about some things that can help ensure that you have a long career in private school leadership. And you have to wear a lot of hats as a private school leader, and you have to have lots of skills. And skills are generally divided into hard skills and soft skills. And as private school leaders, we have to have a lot of skills. And so hard skills, for example, some of the things that it would be great if we were good at all of these things. And I want to acknowledge right away that we're not good at all of them. I'm not good at all of them. And that's why we have people around us, or if you're a one-person show at your school, while you're trying to build your skills in these areas. But just a quick pass through some hard skills, budget creation, creating a master schedule, project management, fundraising, payroll, curriculum development, creating professional development for teachers, evaluation of faculty, facility oversight, and the list goes on and on with hard skills. And boy, that sounds great. Joy, I sure wish that I could check all those boxes. But we also then, as leaders of our private schools, need to have soft skills. And so some soft skills would be interpersonal communication, organization, teamwork, critical thinking, social skills, creativity, adaptability, friendliness, integrity, open-mindedness, empathy, emotional intelligence, problem-solving, dependability, and that list goes on and on and on. And I think it was the first episode of this podcast that I said that there's a well-known quote-unquote joke that goes around um, among some boards of some independent schools when they're asked what you're looking for in a head of school, and the well-known answer is God on a good day. And so that what we do is kind of an unattainable um Uh, there's an unattainable expectation, but we all are in this for the kids and we are in this to fulfill the mission, the vision of the school where we are, where we've been placed, where we've been planted, where we are right now. And we want to bring our best selves to school, but we also know that sometimes that that means that we want to bring and bring our skills that we have and improve the skills that we lack. But what if we could boil all of that, all those lists, all those things that I said, if what if we could boil all of that just down to just four soft skills as the most critical for having a long and happy career as a private school leader? Well, that's exactly what we're going to do on today's episode. We're going to talk about the four soft skills that can ensure a long career as a private school leader. But before we jump into that, I wanted to let you know that I've created a free resource for you called The Six Things That Every Private School Teacher Wants From Their Leader. And this guide is a six-page PDF, and I think it can be a real game changer for you as a leader. And if you do these six things, the teachers at your school will be happy to follow you. And you can grab your guide, The Six Things That Every Private School Teacher Wants From Their Leader, by going to the privateschoolleader.com slash guide. And you can also check out all of the free resources available to you over at the privateschoolleader.com slash resources. There's plug and play PDs to use with your staff or individual staff members. There are top 10 lists and guides and um, all kinds of things over there for you for free at the privateschoolleader.com slash resources. And 
Um, one more thing, as you know, my goal is to help as many private school leaders as possible. And there are actually two ways you can help me with that. And so I'd like to ask you for two quick favors. And the first one is to just please share this podcast with another leader or an aspiring leader that you know. So you know leaders at other schools, you have a keen eye for seeing someone in your own school who might be an aspiring leader, just share the podcast with them. And then the second thing would be, please go to Apple Podcasts and write a review for the podcast because those reviews and ratings help the algorithm push the content out to other leaders as a suggested podcast. And more and more people all around the world are finding the podcast because of the algorithm. So if you can help me out with that, um, I would very, very much appreciate it. And thank you for helping me help private school leaders. So I wanted to tell you that the inspiration for today's episode came from a paragraph in an article in the NAIS magazine from fall 2010. So we're going back a little ways. And the article is called The Intentional Path to Headship. And it's written by Judith L. Schechtman and Mark T. Frankel. And I wanted to just quote, I don't usually read long quotes. This one isn't too long on the podcast, but um, I just want to read a quote from this article and I'll link it in the show notes um, about the importance of soft skills um, in a long, in having a long career as a private school leader. So quote, the importance of what some call soft skills cannot be overstated. Knowledge is important to headship. Successful heads almost always have a solid understanding of curriculum and school sustainability on multiple dimensions. But a constellation of personality factors seems of equal or greater importance and certainly correlate more strongly with derailment, the premature unwinding of a headship career. Among these emotional intelligence, empathy, social awareness, and impulse control. These seem to be increasingly important to success as a head, end quote. And so they're saying that those four soft skills that we're going to talk about in a moment, that not only are they essential and necessary, but in their experience, and they've worked with a lot of schools, that they see that there's a strong correlation between what they call the derailment and premature unwinding of a headship career for heads who do not have these four soft skills. So to hit on them again, the four soft skills that can ensure a long career as a private school leader are number one, emotional intelligence, number two, empathy, number three, social awareness, and number four, impulse control. So we're going to talk about those for a few minutes today. And I just want to give a couple disclaimers. So first of all, I'm going to be, you know, even though there's only four points, I'm going to be listing several things under each one of those points. And so a couple things I want you to know. First of all, I encourage you often to listen to the podcast while you're doing something else because you're so busy as a private school leader. So walking the dog or on your commute or working out or running errands, whatever the case might be. And so if you're doing something else, you can't just be jotting down notes all the time. And that's what the show notes are for. So don't have to try to fiercely write notes or try to remember all this. It'll be there for you in the show notes. The second thing is, is that what I'm about to talk about as far as the subheadings underneath each of these four soft skills is a lot. Like it's a long list and no one is going to do everything. Nobody, no matter how good they are, no matter how high they are in emotional intelligence, no matter how full their tool belt is of soft skills, is going to be able to do all of these things. But I want to break it down, and then um, the call to action will be really simple to just, you know, pick a skill or pick one of the soft skills and pick one area where you'd like to improve. And I think awareness is important to know, Um, and also we're just going to, you know, I just want to kind of set the frame for you that by no means is my goal for this episode for you to feel discouraged that you don't have all of these skills or you don't have all of the things that are listed as part of these soft skills. So 
I just want to set the expectation that th- these are aspirational, always aspirational, and no one ever arrives at fully having these skills. So um, with that being said, with those disclaimers out of the way, let's jump into the four soft skills that can ensure a long career as a private school leader. Number one, emotional intelligence. So we've heard that phrase a lot. And emotional intelligence specifically is the ability to perceive reason with and understand and manage emotions within yourself and from other people. So perceive reason with, understand and manage emotions. Sounds way, it's way easier said than done, right? Um, And so some of the things that go along with emotional intelligence, intelligence, active listening, and we know that we try very hard to use those active listening body language and to not listen with the intent to respond and to not interrupt. So active listening, building trust is huge. Um, Supportive leadership um, under emotional um, intelligence. So supportive leadership is encouraging and fostering a supportive environment that values emotional well-being and mental health. So let me talk about that for a moment. I feel like not all these things for me are a strength but it's probably not best for me to say this is a strength for me. You would have to ask my, my teachers. But I feel like I try to prioritize the emotional well-being and mental health of my teachers, my team. And to make sure that I'm reading their body language, to make sure I'm checking in with them. If I see something that they look like they're having a hard day of you know trying to give grace Um, trying not to jump to conclusions or to ding someone for coming in a couple minutes late when really um, when I talk to them I find out that they're you know giving care to an elderly parent who's just moved in with them and they need time to adjust so I get it that the other side of it is well you've got rules and people need to be on time and with you know there's only a certain number of personal days and of course we need to support all of that so that there's equity But there are ways, and that's why it's called emotional intelligence, for us to intelligently navigate that and to prioritize a supportive environment and to value our people as humans, that they they have mental health, they have issues, they they have emotional well being that is needs to be preserved. And so supportive leadership is a person is a is a is a um, characteristic of someone that's high in emotional intelligence. All right, another one is to display gratitude. I did a whole episode on how gratitude can make you a a happier and more fulfilled leader. Um, And so when you display gratitude, um, something that I do, a gratitude practice, a weekly gratitude practice, and this has changed my life. I've probably been doing this for about four years now, is that every Monday morning on my drive into work takes about 30 minutes is, is that I just start and I just start listing all of the things in my life that I am thankful for. And I go through and I say it out loud as I'm driving. And so I'll say I'm thankful for my wife. And then I'll just list out all the things about my wife that I'm thankful for. And then I'll start, I have three daughters and I'll just start with my oldest daughter and go through all the things I'm thankful for about her. And then my home and my job and <clears throat> um, having a dependable car and you know, all of those, the things that we have to be thankful for. And then I also talk about things that happened years ago where a need, a financial need was met at just the right moment. Um, And so all of these things will, if you're a person of faith, can strengthen your faith. Um, They are certainly things that make us have a different attitude about life in general when we lead, when we have a lens of gratitude and Um, So that's a gratitude practice that I've found that has been super helpful for me. So a person that's high in emotional intelligence will display gratitude. Um, Next on my list, handle criticism maturely. So I think that kind of speaks for itself, and we don't always do that well. Um, Display integrity. Um, If I had to pick one thing that is, if I had to rank things for you as a leader that are most important to least important, I would say that integrity as a leader is number one on the list. Display integrity. You tell the truth. You you know keep your promises. 
you do the right thing even when no one is watching. You don't say one thing to this person and then another diff something totally different to that person. And do I get it right all the time? No, but it's a goal. And I feel like it's the most important thing that we as leaders need to display and model for our teachers and our students and our parents. Um, under emotional intelligence, another thing on my list is to build positive relationships and to build strong and respectful relationships. I think mutual respect, having respectful discourse has kind of taken a hit over the last several years. Um, and it seems like everybody's angry at everybody and there's a lot of yelling, even if it's online, it's in capital letters and exclamation points. And so respectful relationships. Um, another thing that a leader that's high in emotional intelligence will do is to cultivate an atmosphere of trust and open communication among stakeholders in the school. And so that means trust and open communication between you and your teachers back and forth, between the teachers and the parents, between you and the parents. And it can happen. Respect and, and trust and open communication can happen. Um, and I realize that there are outliers, but um, again, being high in emotional intelligence will help us navigate that. A couple more, uh, conflict resolution. Um, you know, resolving conflicts in a constructive manner and considering the emotions and perspectives of everyone that's involved. I mean, I know what my biases are as for, well, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure I have many unconscious biases, but in certain situations, if I stop and think and acknowledge my bias, then maybe I'll be better able to resolve the conflict and to consider the emotions of the other person. Um, to be flexible and adaptable, um, be open to change and receptive to feedback, um, lead by example, and demonstrate emotional intelligence in your own interactions. And if you model that behavior that you wish to see in others, you are more likely to see it. So I'm not going to repeat that whole list. It'll be in the show notes, but just kind of a potpourri of little things that um, all together kind of make up that jigsaw puzzle of emotional intelligence, specifically in our private schools. And again, I want to remind you, all of this is aspirational, and it's hopefully going to cause some reflection and just be like, okay, if I'm honest with myself, I'm pretty good with this area. I'm not very good with that area. You know, I said before that I think I'm pretty good about trying to support, be supportive about emotional well-being and mental health, and I'm pretty good about gratitude, but I can tell you that I'm not great when it comes to um, um, accepting feedback or being flexible. Okay, so I think we just have to be honest with ourselves and we have to um, just see where we're at and then uh, continue to try to grow. And that's why you're listening to this podcast is you're trying to grow yourself as a leader. All right, let's go on to soft skill number two. This one might be a little bit more straightforward, and that's empathy. So I like to talk about putting on your empathy goggles. And these are a set of magic goggles that if you put them on, it allows you to see life the way that that other person sees life. So if it's one of your teachers that's in your office and is really upset about something, if it's a parent that you're talking to and they're really just discouraged or um, unhappy about a situation, um, if it's wh whoever it is that you can, in your mind, try, try, try to put on these magic goggles that are empathy goggles that allow you to see that world, see the world from their perspective. And that makes it a little bit easier to try to understand their unique perspective. You don't have to agree with it. You don't have to think, well, this is a life choice that I would make. But sometimes it helps in the way of trying to see where someone's coming from if you can put yourself in their shoes. And that's what empathy is all about. Um, I believe that empathy is also all about actively listening to students and teachers. And we already talked about listening a little bit when we were talking about emotional intelligence. But I think it's listening and then acknowledging their feelings and concerns. And so, again, that empathy, trying to see things from their perspective and then acknowledging it, trying to just understand. It's, it's very difficult for me to understand someone else's life if their life is very, very different from mine, but um, to just try to have that um, empathic view. Um, and also to create a supportive and inclusive environment where individuals feel comfortable 
expressing themselves and seeking help when needed. So empathy has to do with the acknowledging the differences and trying to understand things from that person's point of view. Well, we also need to make sure that we're doing our best to create emotionally safe and inclusive and supportive environments where people feel comfortable expressing themselves, even if what they're going to express is different than what most people in that room or in that school or in that city might say or do. And so that's one of our responsibilities as servant leaders is to create that safe space. And oftentimes that person has also got some healing to do because of bad experiences in the workplace before they started working at your school. And that's a whole nother episode. Episodes five and six talk uh, on this podcast, talk all about servant leadership. And then finally, under empathy, showing genuine care and concern for the well-being of others and being willing to offer assistance and support. So I really think it comes down to recognizing, trying to put yourself in their shoes and then thinking about, okay, what would be most helpful in this situation? How can I be of assistance? How can I support this person? How can I make them feel seen and heard? And if you think about that intentional encouragement, and I talk often about Maya Angelou's quote, people will forget what you did, people will forget what you said, but people will never forget how you made them feel, that that helps me think of that when I think of that quote, that helps me lead with empathy um, and try to intentionally encourage another person. All right, so the four soft skills that will help ensure a long career in private school leadership. Number one, emotional intelligence. Number two, empathy. And number three, social awareness. So social awareness is a sensitivity to diversity and being socially aware and recognize and appreciate the diversity within your school community. And then a person high in social awareness is also going to promote inclusivity and ensure that all voices are heard and respected. And so you might be thinking that, well, depending on the size of your school and your location and the makeup of your student body, you might be thinking, well, my school is not very diverse. Well, even within your school, there are different, likely some some differences in socioeconomic background. There are certainly differences in experience. Um, there are going to be differences in mental health um, of that person, their mental health and well-being. And so we're not necessarily trying to like look for diversity where it doesn't exist, but uh, I think in schools that lack certain types of diversity that we need to remember that there's diversity within our school and we need to be sensitive to that even if what we look at and the people that we look at, whether it be the color of their skin or the language that they speak, all look pretty similar, that there are still very, very different things going on uh, in our schools with our people. And so, again, social awareness, I think, is a, a person who, a leader who will promote social justice education in your school. And you'll teach kids and, and adults what it means to be an upstander and to maybe implement social justice programs that educate students about societal issues and promoting empathy and understanding. And this is a real core value at our school. And not only do we have formal instruction on that, um, we really try to have social justice and being an upstander be part of the circulatory system of our school of who we are and who our kids are. And a few years ago, I had a seventh grade girl that came up to me and said, hey, Mr. Minkus, there's this thing called No Place for Hate. It's under the umbrella of the Anti-Defamation League, and it's a student-run um, organization, and um, I think that we should have it here at our school. And so I told her what I tell most kids when they come up to me with an idea. I said, start a Google Doc, and that's kind of how I weed out who's serious and who's not, and I tell them, do your research, find out everything, and then once you've got a robust um, Google Doc, then share it with me. And she did. And um, here we are a few years later, and we're in our third year of being a, a chapter, having a chapter of No Place for Hate and having these student-led activities and um, all of the things that go along with that. So, again, um, a, a person that's high in social awareness is going to want the students and staff in their schools to be upstanders. 
And then collaboration with other schools. I mentioned the lack of diversity sometimes in our schools. Well, then maybe we need to partner with another school. And um, a few years back, um, we did this um, for several years in a row until the organization we were partnering with lost their funding. And um, we had students who um, were coming from some underserved, underprivileged um, neighbor neighborhoods that were coming and doing some activities after school with our kids and um, building those relationships. And then they actually would go on the Washington, D.C. trip at the end of the seventh grade year. And um, they would go to the Holocaust Museum and our students would help to educate um, those students. And then they would go to the uh, Museum of um, African-American History. And um, our students had a lot to learn there and it was a great collaboration. And, and now we're seeking to try to find another one now that we've come out of the fog of, of COVID. So collaborating with other schools can increase that diversity. I mentioned mental health support before, um, especially since COVID, so many people with mental health issues. And um, I think that that's not often seen as a diversity issue in our schools. But um, there is a diversity among people and their level of mental health and well-being. Um, and then sustainability, you know, taking care of our world, um, you know, the environment, and just integrating sustainability, sustainability practices into the operation of the school um, just sets the example for the students about the importance of taking responsibility for the environment. And so, again, that social awareness. And then finally, ethical decision-making. Um, I think that that's another thing that in our world I think has kind of suffered um, over the last generation, last 20 years. And um, so we need to model that for our students. If we want them to grow up to be adults that have ethical behavior and make decisions um, ethically, um, then we need to emphasize the important importance of integrity and fairness uh, and model that for our students. So all of those things kind of fall under that umbrella of social awareness. And so that's the third soft skill. And then the fourth soft skill that will help ensure a long career in private school education is impulse control. So I think this is a big one. And we talked about social awareness. This one has a lot to do with self-awareness and just being aware of our own emotions and our own strengths and weaknesses and how to manage our reactions and make well-informed decisions when maybe we're upset or maybe we strongly disagree with the person who's talking right in front of us. That impulse control to interrupt or to display our temper, um, you know, I think it's super important for for private school leaders to have a predictable mood. And we've all worked for bosses in our life where we had to play the worst game show in the history of the world, and that show is called Guess My Mood. Now, we don't like to play that game when it comes to our boss, and so don't make your team play that game with you. Have a predictable mood have that self-awareness, manage your emotions, manage your reactions, and um, you will be displaying impulse control. A couple of other things is, is that we need to manage our stress effectively. Now listen, we're under all kinds of stress. It has to do with the budget and the payroll and paying the electric bill and this parent that's really upset and um, all of the other things down to you know, depending on where you live, do we delay school or do we close school today because of the snow? And you name it, there's a thousand decisions a day that we make. We have that decision fatigue. And then we are just dealing with all of this stress. And so we need to have coping mechanisms, whether that's mindfulness or prayer or journaling or um, meditation or yoga or whatever it might be to do things that will help reduce and manage our, the stress that's inevitable. And I'll be the first to admit that it might be that you need to talk to someone. Um, there have been several times over the years I've shared before on this podcast when I've dealt with some losses in my family as far as um, having sisters that passed away, when my dad passed away, talking to a grief counselor. There are times where we need to talk to somebody. 
um, when I was experiencing severe burnout, um, I talked to a counselor. So it's not a show of weakness for us to talk to somebody. And with the jobs that we have, um, it's probably the person is the exception rather than the rule that um, is okay without getting some help. So again, managing stress, thinking about whether or not I need to talk to somebody, and then thoughtful decision making. Sometimes we have um, to show our impulse control and carefully consider our actions before we make a decision. And sometimes we're guilty of making knee-jerk reactions um, that could have negative consequences because we're not controlling our impulses in that moment. And then we also have to lead by example when it comes to displaying self-control and measured responses. So if we fly off the handle then and we show our emotions in inappropriate ways, let's say our behavior in meetings, then we're modeling for our teams that they can act that way in meetings also, and then they will. So again, that impulse control. Um, active listening, I've talked about that before. The big thing here with impulse control and active listening is to not interrupt. Just think about how much you like being interrupted and then decide whether or not you wanna keep interrupting people, all right? And then the second thing is, is that listening with the intent to respond is not listening. We are problem solvers. We are always trying to quickly get the information so that we can solve the problem. But when we're listening to someone explain something, if all we're doing in our head is thinking about the thing we're going to say, then we're not really listening. Um, a couple more things under this impulse control is um, seeking feedback, um, gathering different points of view, um, just being consistent, again, um, over time without those knee-jerk reactions. Um, handling uh, conflict resolution calmly and professionally and trying to avoid an impulsive reaction in a high stress situation that may just escalate the situation. And then acknowledging our mistakes, um, being open to acknowledging and learning from mistakes and just knowing that it's okay to course correct. It's important that we apologize when we mess up. And then the last thing under this section of impulse control is to focus on our long-term goals. If we stay focused on the school's vision and mission and we continue to try to take the big picture view, which is what we're supposed to do as leaders, then we'll be less likely to make impulsive decisions that are micromanaging type decisions and pet project type decisions that may deviate from the objectives of our school. And so those are all kind of the under the umbrella of um, impulse control. So I told you before, I gave a disclaimer at the beginning that there was going to be a lot. You know, I don't usually rattle off long lists on the podcast. Usually it's more bite-sized strategies, but I'll take good care of you in the show notes. Um, the big takeaways are, do you want to have a long career as a private school leader? And if so, you need some hard skills and some soft skills. And according to the article that I'll link in the show notes, the four soft skills that can ensure a long career as a private school leader are emotional intelligence, empathy, social awareness, and impulse control. And your call to action is to pick one soft skill and then just pick one action that you can take to grow yourself in that area. And I want to say thank you for listening to the podcast by giving you another free guide this one's called Five Strategies to Help You Work with Difficult Parents. And parents can be great, but they can also be really, really demanding and emotional. And this guide will give you tools to have better relationships and have better meetings with the difficult parents at your school. And you can get that over at theprivateschoolleader.com slash parents. And if you're getting value from the podcast, I'd love to hear from you. Send me an email, mark.o.minkus at gmail.com. And make sure you subscribe to the podcast. One more time, you can find the show notes at theprivateschoolleader.com slash episode 45. And you can connect with me on Instagram at theprivateschoolleader or Twitter at the PS Leader. And also, one last time, I'll just ask you that if you get value from this podcast, please subscribe and please share it with other leaders and aspiring leaders in your life. And it's been a privilege to be your host today. I just want to say how much I appreciate you and all the work that you do at your school and how much I appreciate you taking some precious time out of your busy week to join me here today. And I will see you next time right here on the Private School Leader Podcast. And until
Until then, always remember to serve first, lead second, and make a difference.